Yeah, an accelerated week. Um, feels later in the week already, uh, other than seeing you guys, which kind of brings some normalcy back to to the routine. Um, I thought it was another um, thorough game from from our team, meaning that um, I thought all three phases were were in sync and performed in our word complimentary in terms of complimentary football um, time of possession ended up being again a de the deciding factor which is um, indicative of our ability to to become a more effective running team which has probably been something that I've seen growth and progress in the past three weeks plenty and tons of room still to grow but our ability to rush the football and hold on to the football in terms of times of time of possession, get off the field on third down defensively, and then have our special teams change field position. That simple formula has, I think, carried us through um, the past number of weeks. Uh, the turnover margin is still helpful in addition to that. And yeah, there's just tons of room to grow and learn and keep, keep progressing, which is our focus. And that's what I expect from our team. How much has all this been player driven this season in terms of holding each other accountable? And is that what you look for as a coaching staff? Is I think it's ideal? become I think it's become more player driven, um, starting with uh, Chris Peace kind of defining the new standard. And I think it was the leadership on our team claiming the principles that were being presented as theirs and and then owning them. And I think uh, really sincerely considering those, the standards that will help the program and believing in them, which then led to accountability, um, not necessarily in a punishment way, but a standard that then was expected and embraced as this will work and this is what we will do. And if you're not doing it, there's really, um, you're an outlier and so choose is kind of the message from our players to others that maybe took longer than what was expected to choose. Bronco, teams set goals before the season, some shared, some not. You know, everybody says they want to win the championship and, and that kind of stuff. Um, when when guys la after last game were saying, we want the Coastal, like saying it out loud, like just announcing it to the ACC that this is what we want, um, is that a good thing? Is that something you're – more comfortable with than a couple weeks ago? Yeah, I'm, I'm never uh, really comfortable about, um, you know, promising uh, things in advance, but I, I don't have a problem with establishing and framing goals. And so I think in that moment when they're saying we wanted the Coastal, I think it was just simply um, some clarity on it is possible. Um, we have a, a real chance and uh, we're acknowledging that, and so I don't think it was any other, in any other way, shape, or form presented other than um, maybe they just couldn't help say it um, because it's new and it's exciting, and uh, and so in that context, I think it was great. My job then is to say, okay, if that's what you really want, let me help you understand what it, what that's going to take, and then the focus goes right back into what we need to do. And <clears throat> being ranked, does that? Does that present a, a, another challenge for you guys? Like, is today's practice going to be until they drop, like a couple weeks ago, just to make sure their attention stays where it needs to be? It, it might have been. It might be if it was have been if it was a Saturday game. Um, there's not time. <laughs> so, I think that um, I think that the the rankings are are a byproduct and, and maybe outside acknowledgement. And I, and I think that. Prior to week eight, the rankings have zero bearing um, other than possible intrigue to make either players or fans be, feel better about themselves but it, um, and maybe the intrigue of a television matchup. But nobody can know um, until the beginning of week eight or, or the completion of week eight what, what does this really look like. And I think it was indicative this week of the number of teams that lost, the new number of teams that are added. It's just now starting to become relevant. And, and I, I would say it's just now starting to become relevant. It's, it's just the beginning of now the home stretch of what will it really look like. 
prior to the completion of week eight, I think the rankings are a complete waste of time. And so I'm, I'm excited for our team that there is increased attention on the program. Um, but we framed it um, actually with Dave Kane's help. He, he told me uh, one of the things that Tony, uh, Coach Bennett talks about and comparing kind of the accolades and those kind of things to the cotton candy where it takes a lot of time to eat it. You get all sticky. It's not filling and you usually feel worse when you're done. Um, by, so any acknowledging that stuff um, does nothing for us. Um, it is addicting, right? Praise is addicting and it feels really good. Um, however, every second we spend dwelling there, it's taking us farther away from our objective. That's my job, is to make sure we're on point. Was it mind-boggling sitting there watching the Pittsburgh film of them rushing for about 500 yards? And with the success you've had against the run the last two weeks, how much emphasis is on that this week? Oh, it's, it's, it's huge um, because I, I believe Duke is a good defensive team. and in college football, maybe in professional football, not having coached at that level, it just seems like sometimes there are this, just those games. Um, but other times those games are caused by great preparation on one side and maybe an off day on the other. Um, big plays <laughs> led to all kinds of yardage on both sides of that game. Um, and I think it's atypical for, for that kind of game to happen, but it, it did where both sides were having those signif that significant number of big plays. Um, Pitt is a unique challenge. Um, if I were to speak about their offense for a moment, um, I think they're very physical. Um, that comes from the past couple of years that we've played and just learning about our ACC opponents a little bit better. So I think they're a physical and a tough football team. Um, so you have to be um, really sound in your fundamentals. But then offensively, um, creativity and misdirection um, and the type of run, so you have a physical nature that you have to, to certainly be prepared for in your fundamentals and mindset, but then your eye control has to be very good because of the nature of the run games. There's lots and lots of misdirection. And, and that's a unique challenge. Um, and defensively, they, they certainly um, they, they don't want the opponent to run the ball an inch. They're very aggressive. Um, they're not afraid to take chances. And, and they rely um, a lot on players in space and the secondary to make plays. And so um, I think when I look at the matchup, uh, it's, it's hard to acknowledge anything other than the ACC records. Um, and we're, as I was looking at this, 4-1 and one and, and Pitt is 3-1. and one. The games outside of that, they certainly are relevant for possible rankings or what your, your record looks like. But really, this is 4-1 and one versus 3-1, and one, the way I see it. And, and it will probably be about that kind of matchup in terms of, of, um, of competitiveness as well. Sticking with that uh, run game theme, what has worked so well run defense for you guys? What's been the key? I think that um, starting from the minute uh, our game finished last year against Navy, just the, um, the sheer um, weaknesses that were exposed that we had kind of played around and through as much as possible through two years. Um, but there had to be a, a completely um, recommitted effort to size, strength, fundamentals, and just simply the mindset to continue to play in your gap over and over and over and over and again and what that looks like and what that feels like and what mindset that requires. So it's been a relentless pursuit of run fundamentals the minute the Navy game was over, just knowing that our program would not nor could not take another step forward until we got that addressed. That game just happened to highlight it. Um, and so it doesn't mean that we've arrived yet, and we have plenty of work to do, and this game will certainly be a unique test. Uh, but that's, that's when it started, and it's ongoing. Nothing has changed, um, including today. Do you have an update on Jordan Mack and Malcolm Cook for us? I don't have an update on Malcolm Cook. Um, Jordan Mack, he, he's, he's getting better every day. And so um, it's great timing for us. Uh, we anticipate him becoming close to full strength, if not this Saturday by the next one, but certainly close enough and well enough to play this week. And so, yeah, that'll really help. In the meantime, uh, Rob Snyder played really well in that last game. We already know what Zane has been capable of doing, and we've seen more of him. But maybe the the hidden story in this is is Rob. Rob is really doing a nice job.
I was going to ask you about the top 25, but obviously you answered a little twist on that. It appears that your recruiting has gone better to this point than it has in, in your previous seasons. What changes have you made, or do you think the, the success on the field has been the major factor? I think there's two things contributing. Um, certainly uh, time has helped. Um, so there was a strong kind of f first class, meaning just because of the reputation of our staff and the previous successes, um, there were those saying, man, this, I want to be part of this. This could work. Um, and then when we made it to postseason in our second year, that continued. At the finish of that year, Carla arrives. And I I'd, I'd had basically two years of experience here prior to our first meeting. And we, I believe, after those two years, I understood more clearly we were understaffed in terms of our personnel area. Um, we were about half staffed in relation to what our competitors were. Um, and so the coaches were having to do more work in terms of the legwork and finding in addition to coaching, while some staffs had the legwork and finding happening while the coaches were coaching, and so we were late. And we were still effective, but we were late frequently. And so after presenting that and, and then Carla assessing where we were in relation to our competitors, she created positions for us. So we have more, more uh, personnel uh, or more people in our personnel area as well as um, uh, a new on-campus recruiting coordinator, which has really helped. And so that's, that organization is just going around the clock now while the coaches are also working around the clock with the football part. And so that's helping us be competitive in, in finding early, developing relationships early, evaluating effectively, matching our needs, and then hosting appropriately, which really helps. It helps, especially when the games the kids come to or they watch us play on, we win. And so uh, when you consider the, the fairly rapid turnaround um, that's happening, um, not happened, but happening at UVA, uh, I don't know how you could not pay attention. And it, it's, not, it's not normal for it to happen in this amount of time. And it's certainly not normal when the deficit was so large. And so the that story is becoming pretty compelling to, to those that are have interest in our program. Bronco back here. Joey Blunt was just in here, and he's just a good example of the second-year guys you have all over the defense who are playing bigger and bigger roles. How significant of an impact? Just that class as a whole on defense and the way you've been able to integrate them. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's great. We had one year with them. We played, I think, 17 of those guys a year ago, which was our first class. and. And now it's just year two. Um, they're really, really close. They like each other a lot. They respect each other as players. That means they think each other are good players. They like, they like the mindset that our coaches bring. And they came for a very specific reason. Uh, and to this point, I think what they've received is exceeding expectations. And so they're just happy. Uh, and they feel good about the decision they made. They like the outcome. And I think it's, it's possibly um, we presented to them that it, it's not if, but when. And they would control that, talking about that first class. And they've taken that to heart, and they are controlling it. I don't know if he'll ever have the stats to get all ACC recognition, but Eli Hamback is a three-year starter on the line and an integral part of your team and your defense. What's his value to the line, to the defense, and to the program as a whole? Just – you know every single day that he's going to be there and he's going to do his job and he's going to do it in the rain or the snow if we're ahead, if we're behind, if it's first down, if it's fourth down, and then he's going to show up at practice in the weight room. He just he requires zero maintenance and he just does his job every single day at a level that um, is exemplary. And that that simple steadiness with what we just mentioned, all the younger guys, he just – He's just always doing what he's supposed to do, which is a great example. Speaking of Eli, and now that he's at the nose, you haven't had Jordan Redmond on the field, I don't think at all, the last few games. Is that is he still healthy? Is that Does he play a bigger role now, given that you're going to play some, you know, obviously run heavy teams coming up here soon? It, it depends on the team that we're playing. So um, Eli and Mandy, um, those two players, yeah, if we don't have to take them off the field, we don't intend to. And so they're playing 
they'll, they're basically, their tongues are hanging out right now, but they're both capable of that. Aaron Famui has moved into kind of the third position right now, um, and then Jordan uh, would be fourth. And so his current skill set, his current ability level, and his current, um, I would say the match for his, uh, for what he can bring to our defense is downhill and right at you. Um, once things be, start to go lateral and side to side, that's not currently a strength, and he's working on that. And he's working really hard in practice. Uh, but it's nice to have, again, Eli um, setting the tone, Mandy learning from him, and then Aaron learning from him, and then Jordan coming along. And so we've just been able to staff our defense with more linebackers. And, and uh, yeah, we've – Coach Howell and the defensive guys, they've done a really good job. And it's exhausting working hard enough to find the right 11 defensive players with the right skill set to put on the field versus what we're seeing. And that's why you see so many guys running in and out. And um, But we've dialed it in uh, pretty pretty well um, up to this point. And, but this next week is a challenge. You, uh, you had a new look on kickoff return with number 92 back there. What, what do you like about Paris Jones? And was that a one-time deal? Or could he be back there? Or no, he, he, be he back could there? be back there. He's earned it in practice. Um, Again, our practices are very competitive, and yeah, I watch every play of every player every day. And what he's been doing from fall camp all the way to now, um, it just became the point where he was outperforming others in practice, and and that's a great way to get on the field. And I'm I'm not happy currently. I'm happy with our special teams collectively. Our kickoff return is underperforming in my mind. I'm pretty happy with the other three at this point uh, and the progress and some of the steps we're making. Um, so yeah, there's just a, another message being sent that if you do your job really well in practice, then and you can help uh, uh, our team in an area that I think needs improvement, then we're going to try you. And that's what's happened. He did a nice job, too. Do you have an update on the health of Tim Harris? I don't. Um, nope, it's the accelerated week. Basically, no one's talked to me um, other than you guys right now. And so I'll have to fill you in maybe tomorrow. And building on Doug's question, uh, you mentioned when you got here you were kind of understaffed. Was the size of the staff different from what you had at BYU? No. At, at BYU, th this, we actually had more resources in personnel than we had at BYU. Uh, but I, what I also learned really quickly is, is it does no good to compare any other place to Brigham Young University. Uh, that school, um, that institution is magical and very unique. The 98.5% of all the students that attend are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's one faith. There's a natural and immediate draw as soon as members of um, our faith have children and they're hoping they can play football. There's already a strong push uh, to play at BYU. And so the finding component is filtered much differently. Um, than what we currently face in Power Five football as one of the schools that many of these kids can choose from, maybe not the school they've always grown up wanting to attend. And so those two simple reference points uh, didn't take long to figure that out and then reconsider how we best build this program. So you coach there playing, playing double duty? Coach mm -hmm, but um, not nearly the volume, meaning that um, you might recruit an entire class of anywhere from 35 to, to 40 total players. Players that then were D Division I football players who also wanted to live the standards of the church, who also um, had a desire to, uh, yeah, to, to play at BYU and then have to fit a position of need. And so that, you can't have a more constraining set of filters than that. And so uh, the, the existing personnel, staff, and numbers, um, we, we knew where every single LDS player was, not only in the United States, but <laughs> in multiple countries. Um, and so, and then any additional work came to young men of strong Christian values that maybe wanted those standards that weren't members of the, the, um, the, the, the church, but wanted a similar lifestyle. So again, it, it wasn't, it's not comparable, and I learned that quickly when I arrived here. Coach, you, um, I think BYU went independent in 2011. So you haven't kind of been in a title race as a coach in a while either. So kind of two questions. One, are you having fun? Two, did you go back 
to old binders at, for you know title race time of year or kind of how are you framing it? No, um, haven't haven't needed to go back to to title title uh, race binders. Um, it just is. It's refreshing uh, to not have to travel all across the country um, to play games that um, that not many people maybe are interested in later in the year. Early in the year as an independent, there's strong interest because people are willing to play. Um, later in the year when conference races begin, um, folks don't line up to play BYU or travel to Provo. So um, that uh, um, it's a neutral playing field that every game matters. They all have significant influence and, and import is, is, I think it's just good for the players. It's great for the mindset of the organization, uh, but it's also, it's just, it's a more meaningful and rich college experience uh, when you're part of a conference and especially if uh, you're performing well enough to be in the hunt uh, going into um, November, December. Bronco, you mentioned after the game that Bryce has exceeded expectations at quarterback. Um, I think I mentioned before the season that it's kind of unusual to have a quarterback not be one of the captains, but it sounds like from what the guys that were in here earlier said that he's kind of become a de facto captain. Yeah. And, 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 and one who has no history with last year when you guys got cocky after five wins or, you know, whatever. Um, how much has that meant to what you guys have been able to do? Yeah, so I think – I think that um, I think it's mattered a lot simply through his performance, um, and yeah, captains are are voted on at the end of fall camp based on the information that's in front of us through a winter and and a spring and, and a summer, and so that's limited information. It's much like a head coach or leaders asked usually, my my day is usually full of making decisions that are um, impactful with partial information. Uh, given to me someone usually that has a different agenda than what might be best for the entirety of the organization and it's usually under a time frame. So in this case the players did their best to identify players that they absolutely knew and had history with that were trustworthy and, and certainly could play. It hasn't taken long though for Bryce to basically be considered as that um, without necessarily the title and, and I think everyone is great with that. Um, I've been asked uh, in relation to the second part of your question um, I wouldn't say that our team uh, became arrogant or cocky. Our, our team just faced a brand new set of circumstances, meaning they were winning. And, um, and they were winning and were qualified for postseason with still games to play. And that was quite a unique place to be. And so uh, I think as we consider the, just the simple outcome of bowl eligibility after this blast game, and you compare it to fan storming the field after Georgia Tech and our a year ago and our fans, the way they reacted, the expectations have already moved. And, and so that's just part of growth and progress, um, which again, it's developing, not developed, but it's, we can already sense it. And there are some indicators, if you just take last week, that kind of show based on the reaction that, oh, okay, that's, we expect that. Now what else? And that's, that's uh, more indicative of where this team currently is. You mentioned that Pittsburgh is three and one in the league. Um, when you look at the standings and, and the rankings, Syracuse gets in for the first time since 2001. BC gets in. Three teams join the poll, like kind of at the tail end this week. What does it say about the ACC that some of these some of these programs that have been carrying the banner for so long are kind of almost taking a backseat to to some of these rising programs? Well, I, I think it's um, I think it's a compliment um, to to Coach Adazio and and to Dino at Syracuse and, and the consistency and work they do, um, it's really easy to default every single year to picking ACC standings how they have been before. It's really easy to default to national rankings and list the top 10 just by, I don't know, monetary or history. It's, it's easy. It takes more diligence um, to report but also to support teams that, wait a second, there could be something special happening here. And so I just think it's timing. Again, it's taken eight weeks worth um, of kind of the... <laughs> You're supposed to p pick up some milk on the way home, I think. <laughs> I like a kind of a home feel to our press conferences. That's good. Yeah, I like that. 
authenticity. Anyway, I think that um, it just it's it's nice for the teams that have earned their way in through eight weeks to be acknowledged, and that that really is is the message that I see. Um, it doesn't mean any of us will stay for one more week based on the outcome, uh, but I think it's uh, I think it's healthy, and I think it's necessary to see possibly seven teams go out and 11 come in or 11 go out and seven come in as an basically an indictment against the current rankings as to what are we doing and why does it even exist prior to this time of year and so I actually think the the playoff ranking timing they have it right uh it no longer to me is relevant for anything before then and so um and that's probably the the greatest compliment at least to our team and the others you mentioned is at least to this point yeah nice job and then that gets you at least till next Friday or Saturday. To follow up on that, are you a dramatically better improved football team than the one that went and lost to NC State? Or, or how should people kind of separate there? No, I, I think that just particularly on that day, there were three to five plays, as always, that, man, they made and we didn't. Um, we had a couple scores that uh, are a fourth down and a score at the end that might have been made or might have made that a one touchdown game. There's plenty of opportunities. NC State played better on that day. And that's what happens in the ACC. You have to make the plays necessary to win the game. And we've done that more since that game. They made more in that game, and they deserve to win it. Um, how that would look now, and if they came to Virginia in week nine, I don't know. Um, and I'm not saying that that discounts that win because they played better. But man, week to week, it changes pretty rapidly. and. Man, there's a small handful of plays each week that really determine outcome, including our last one. Looking specifically at Bryce's three touchdown passes in the game, um, two looked like really good throws, really good routes. The throw to Hasis wasn't great. Hasis made the play and then turned it into something. Are you seeing his receivers uh, making more plays, doing more for him as the season goes on? You know, I think I think it's just been similar. Um, I think Alamade um, has is always capable. And, and to this point, though, has not been where there's been these, these mind-boggling number games back-to-back. -back. There's kind of been one and then a little less and then one. It's kind of been in every other thing. S certainly attributed to some of the way the defenses are playing him after a big week. But Bryce's delivery and where he's putting the ball and how I think has been pretty consistent. Hasis has been consistent. Um, what was good to see, so I, to answer the question, I think Alamade and Hasis have been a very consistent throughout. I think Bryce has been, in this game, Joe Reed um, was downfield making a nice play, which, man, that's that was a great thing for all of us. And then Evan Butts was downfield. Normally he's just a chain mover. And so really the story in relation to your question was Joe Reed downfield and Evan Butts downfield making um, significant plays. That's, that's uh, new and different than what has been happening in relation to that other group we, we were talking about. Yeah, we worked hard to get him the ball and and uh, didn't have the yield that I think I thought we would with the number of touches we worked to have him get. Um, however, there's uh, I think it, it's certainly worth the investment and, and um, it's going to take just a little more time to get that role dialed in as tightly as we want it. Very early on the other day, <clears throat> you praised Lester. Now, his numbers aren't what they were last year. He hadn't had a, a lot of 60-yard uh, punts seems like he's gone to the rugby kick and why did you make that move and yeah I, I think Lester's performing really really well in fact um, the average return against us right now is I think uh, um, under three yards so there are no returns against us where is where Lester is putting the ball is exactly where we want it and really what's hurt our net or hurt Lester's statistics more is our and we've worked hard on this recently Early in the year, we were not defending or we were not downing the pooch punts nearly as effectively as we did a year ago, and there were three to five of them that um, were mind-boggling that we we weren't downing the football effectively, and so with increased emphasis. But that's hurt some of um, his numbers. But I think he's performing every bit as well, maybe even better than a year ago in terms of consistency, ball placement, and helping our team. So we just haven't supported him in some of the. The, the pooch situations of downing the football effectively. And about three or four weeks ago, we started addressing that with a different vigor than we did before.